So when you hear the word pandemic, it's easy to feel afraid. I realize that. There is visions of black plague and the Spanish influenza that come to mind. Global diseases where millions of people were killed and that society completely changed. And today we live in a global world and where contagious diseases can spree, spread even faster than ever before. But we also live in a world where we have more science than ever before, thanks to many of our great Nobel laureates. Uh, and during the Black Plague, no one had any idea whatsoever about what spread the disease and actions how to stop this pandemic and the things that they did often made the disease even worse. And even the Spanish flu virus strain was not isolated until decades after the outbreak. So that said, now it's much easier to feel a little bit more positive and optimistic this evening. And we have so much more knowledge and many more tools to counter these problems. And we also have organizations and resources far beyond what has ever been seen before. So, we are extremely curious now to listen to this conversation and we also want to spread knowledge just as you. So we want to welcome Peter Doherty, Nobel Laureate of 96 in medicine. <laughs> and you are also the writer of a book with the title Pandemics, What Everyone Needs to Know. Uh, we are also very proud to welcome uh, Hanne Wiebeke Holst, whose book some Pesten is a realistic account of an influenza, uh, influenza pandemic and the efforts to stop it. And the moderator tonight is Amina Manso, science journalist at Dagens Nyheta, who actually said, I love pandemics when we asked her to moderate. <laughs> so a warm welcome to all of you and we look forward to this night. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm a medicine journalist at Dagens Nyheter and uh, when I was asked I said I love pandemics because, you know, it's a novel flu, it's a novel virus, there's something, you know, something that everyone can uh, understand, it's something that probably people are scared of and I will, one of my, you know, um, um, I can explain to people and help them understand it. So, but, but now I have, you know, two experts here on <laughs> pandemics, so I don't have to explain anything myself, I can just ask the question. So, Sir Peter, let's start with you. Could you define a pandemic for us so that all of us know what you're talking about, we're talking about? Well, a pandemic is basically an infection that spreads comes out of nowhere often and uh, spreads across the world, pandemos, ac across, the, across the global population. And um, classically, it's uh, been influenza that, that has spread in that way uh, because it spreads very quickly. And it can come out of wildlife reservoirs or out of domestic animals in various ways. It's so, sort of complicated, but uh, the big pandemics of our, our time are influenza and of course the HIV AIDS pandemic, which is kind of a continuing pandemic. Influenza pandemics happen and then they, they, they kind of end or they, they sort of fade away, if you like. But, uh, but the HIV pandemic has now been going on since uh, 1980s. And it came into the human population at some stage, possibly in the 1920s from, uh, from chimpanzees or, or one of the big primates, possibly um, because it's, it's, it's transmitted by blood or body fluids and possibly by someone who is killing a chimp or, uh, for what, what's called bushmeat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they may have cut their hand and got a blood infection as a result. So, um, but that's, I mean, the worst pandemic of our time in a sense. So, but the, um, the flu pandemics, yeah. that's what we usually think about when we uh, talk about pandemics. But why are they so scary for most of us, or some of us at least? Well, the, the, the influenza pandemics, uh, we had a, a horrific influenza pandemic at the end of the First World War, the 1914-18 war. And it's called the 1918-19 influenza pandemic. It, um, it actually, uh, it's called the Spanish flu. Uh, the reason it's called the Spanish flu, it probably, there's, there's debate about this, but it possibly 
uh, came from China to the United States uh, at the stage where the United States was was getting involved in the war, which was 1917, they were suddenly bringing enormous numbers of young men together in, in recruit camps. And what may have happened is the virus may have got into the recruit camps, got ramped up in those camps, and then been brought across to, um, to uh, Europe uh, by the American troops. Uh, another possibility is it actually had been around for longer than we think, and it had... Uh, it suddenly sort of flared up for some reason. But the reason it's called the Spanish flu is that it was killing people on the Anglo-Allied side and on the Anglo-French and, uh, and on the German side. And, of course, neither side really wanted to admit that their armies were being compromised by this infection. Uh, Spain wasn't in the war, and they put their hand up and said, hey, we've got the influenza. So everyone calls it the Spanish flu. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the one country that's completely blameless all this, in all this is Spain. But, uh, you know, any lawyer will tell you never admit anything, um, like President Trump, you know, just don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so there is a political uh, dimension to flu, and uh, that brings me to the first question to you, Hanna Wiebeke. So you wrote an uh, extensive novel on uh, uh, a new pandemic. <laughs> I think it's 848 pages or something like that. Uh, so... So how come you wrote, how come the pandemics uh, is uh, such a thrilling subject that you wanted to write a novel on it? Um, there are many, many interesting layers for a writer in a pandemic because as of course the horror of the pandemic, uh, the outbreak and how do we react, the panic and all that. We know that, uh, you can only imagine how that would be. But then there's, of course, many political and economical and layers and moral and ethical questions when you just go beneath the surface of what you think will happen if a, a, a pandemic influenza will break out. Because it's not like you could imagine that it's there's one outbreak and then you have a pandemic influenza. It's in three waves. You have first wave, second wave, and third wave. And when I started to write about it, I thought that, okay, then there's the first wave, and then they can see that now you have a novel uh, influenza type, because it's always a novel type. And in my story, it's a duck flying over <laughs> the Ukraine <laughs> yeah, it could be from, a duck. Chi from China. <laughs> Definitely could be a duck. It could be a duck. Um, beware of ducks, <laughs> <laughs> especially Donald ducks. <laughs> um, um, so... So when I started this novel, I was very interested in, to see how would we react. And I thought as a citizen in a modern world that everybody would react properly, properly and, and how they should. But I soon, <laughs> I so I soon um, detected that that's not the case. There's so many different uh, interests. And my novel is taking place in uh, Geneva, and the center of the, of the of the story is uh, WH uh, World Health Organization, and uh, my uh, protagonist, uh, my main uh, character, is a female doctor, a Danish doctor, who is working there, and she's the responsible for for the uh, f uh, for the for the outbreaks, and sh she just uh, started her job, and she think she thought as I did, very naive that okay, we have this outbreak in the Ukraine, and now everybody was, will do what they have to do, mm. but they didn't. Mm. No, so when I read the uh, story, I was just thinking that she, she, she is an idealist. She thinks that yeah. people will behave certain ways, and she tries to raise the questions to her bosses and uh, to the heads of the WHO but she doesn't get any response. So, but you have all, you know, you have the WHO, you have the CDC, you have epidemiologists, then you have all of these um, layers or um, organizations and people in the book. So how much research did you do? And oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of research. I talked, I didn't know Peter at that time, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I talked to other, other specialists in the field and I did a lot of research and I went to Geneva several times and uh, went to see uh, <coughs> people at the WHO and 
and uh, one of the last, I think I was there four or five times, and one of the last times, the one, my prime source in the WHO said to me, mm, I think we should go to my private home and discuss this. <laughs> because they are bugged. They think they are bugged, they're oh. probably bugged. Huh. So it was better to go somewhere else to discuss how it really is. Because uh, as I said, there are so many political and economical, uh, um, what do you say, um, not, not problems, um, hindrances to, to do all that what you should do. And she, was, she felt more confident not to talk about that in, in her office. So there's also a part in the um, in the book where they go to the home of the um, UN. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, a person who works at the UN, high level person at the UN. The, the chief of UNOC, United Nations, United yeah. Nations office at Geneva. Yes, yeah. so when they go to this home just because they want to speak yeah. in private. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did so you? So it's it's much more twisted than you think. And he was actually. Uh, He's one of my heroes in real life, and he's also in the, in the novel a hero. Yeah. And uh, he was the one who told me, because he was at that time the director of United Nations office at Geneva, which is the, the UN representation in Europe. And I asked him, what, what would you actually do if you had this outbreak in Europe? And what do you think, what would happen, and what would the UN do, and what would the world uh, society do? What, what would we do? And then he said, will we be fucked, I asked him, <laughs> frankly. And then he said, hmm, it depends on the leadership. What is the political leadership at a given moment? And it's now, what, four or five years ago? And already at that time, <laughs> he was very, he was very uh, insecure about uh, the cleverness of the political leadership, and I think if we had talked today, he would he would be even yeah, more even worried. More insecure, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so Peter, you, what do you think about is p uh, the political leadership important uh, in a? Uh, with well, I think with in influenza, we're sort of accustomed to the idea uh, that influenza pandemics occur. One one of the really fascinating things about the the great influenza pandemic, the 1918, 1918-1919 uh, pandemic, is that um, it killed about, we think, uh, probably at least 50 million yeah. people, but we're not sure because uh, in many places they weren't counted. The old African countries, the colonies and so forth, they didn't really have a count. And, um, but it killed more people than the First World War. But what's extraordinary about it from the literary point of view is there was almost nothing in literature about this pandemic. Mm. There are some very good books mm. about the pandemic, <laughs> medical, factual type books, but there was no literature from it. And it's really only over the last, um, probably the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a literature <laughs> that's actually going back to it. There's, uh, there's one of the, the guy that wrote Shutter Island, yeah. wrote a book about uh, the, what happened in Boston's uh, and the police department. Yeah in the influenza pandemic. And, and th that's a book from, I guess, the 90s, really, isn't it? And so, quite extraordinary. So, I think everyone was in such grief and shock and horror after the war, that even though the influenza pandemic was much broader than, than what happened in Europe, I mean, it, it affected everywhere, uh, nobody much wrote about it. But maybe we should also uh, uh, tell that the thing about uh, these pandemic influences is that they are uh, much, uh, they are, they are uh, worse for the youngs, for the adults, young adults and young. Well, they, they can be. They um, the pandemic, um, uh, the 1918 pandemic, usually influenza is uh, what we call uh, seasonal influenza. Yeah. The, these are viruses that are circulating. That's circulating here, right? These now. are the <laughs> normal flus we get, the, the viruses that are circulating in a population. There's, uh, for instance, there's the, the seasonal flus in the States at the moment are spreading very rapidly. They're, they're getting a lot of cases in places like Alabama. All 50 states are affected. You can get an influenza virus will grow, go right, right through the United States in six weeks without any trouble at all. In fact, pretty much around the world, quite frankly. 1918-19, uh, uh, when people got places by ship, uh, the 1918 flu virus didn't get to Australia till 1919. Mm. 
because it had to come by ship. And of course, if you're traveling by ship, and if people are going to die of the infection, they have time to die before they yeah. get there. So, yeah. uh, so it slowed the whole thing down. By the time it got to Australia, the virus was less virulent. Mm. And, mm. and in, in the main, we had less of a severe uh, disease problem, though we had a terrible, terrible losses in our indigenous mm. uh, communities. And mm. indigenous communities in Alaska and Australia, for instance, uh, some Alaskan uh, villages, the only, the only people left were the yeah. children. Yeah. All the adults died. And the, sa the same goes for Greenland. Yes. They had the same. Yeah, so, and, and genetically there may be some, there's some yeah. reasons for and that. And also, all you mentioned Africa. Yeah. And as you said, they never counted it because they could, yeah. they didn't have the measure to count it, but it was a severe, it was terrible. Yeah. It was, I think it was, I think I read it was like uh, 1.8 they think uh, millions uh, death in yeah. uh, Africa at that time. Quite possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We didn't really know. No, well, it's not about one yeah. point million. It was one point eight percent. One point eight percent. Yeah. Yeah. Of the population. Of the population. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere around two percent. Yeah. Uh, death rate. Uh, now, I think, as you mentioned, the influenza outbreak was in 1919, 1918. The first isolation of an influenza virus is in 1933, I think it is. Mm. The first isolation of human influenza virus, about 1934. The first one was a pig. So it took us 15 years. The, si the state of the science was such that it took 15 years to actually get an influenza virus out. Yeah. And, and now uh, we would have the answer in 24 hours um, by modern technology. So. Yeah, and uh, so we had um, we had a pandemic uh, ten years ago in two thousand and nine. Yeah. It wasn't that severe. The swine flu. Yeah, the swine flu, as we yeah. say, uh, but it wasn't that severe. No, it didn't. Uh, well, that was the thing. You see, th 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 what what people think when they hear the word pandemic is shock horror. Some something. This is going to kill large numbers of people. We're in terrible risk. But the actual definition of pandemic for the World Health Organization for an influenza virus is a virus that spreads between, I think, more than two World Health Organization regions. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the WHO divides the planet up into various yeah. regions. They're not sort of equal regions the way you cut up an orange. Mm. They're actually just mm. political regions. So it's kind of a nonsense declaration. But, but the thing is, with this influenza pandemic, which was... Uh, no, no worse than the actual seasonal type influenza, but it was a novel virus. Uh, once it had spread between two or three regions, WHO had to call it a pandemic. Mm. So once it's called a pandemic, it becomes a shock horror. Mm. So it's just, uh, it, it's one of the things that really, I think they thought a lot about after that. I don't yeah, know whether absolutely. they changed their definition, did they? You were no, I don't think so. They yeah, said it's kind of a silly... Regions. Because other viruses, I mean, you, you know the norovirus, for instance. Yeah. You know if you're on a cruise ship and then suddenly everyone gets diarrhea and they're sick <laughs> and your cruise is... Don't go to the buffet. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's better than going to the volcanoes. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know, uh, it, your, your, your holiday's kind of spoiled because <laughs> it's really horrible. But we get pandemics of those all the time and, and, and uh, because there's novel viruses coming out. But nobody... If you, nobody talks about them in the sense that we talk about influenza. But, but did you think that the WHO has learned something from the latest uh, pandemic because they got a lot of criticism on how they handle it? And uh, in Sweden, at well least, there were some... Uh, there are a lot of young people, uh, children have uh, gotten the narcolepsia from the vaccine. As it's a it's it not a lot, but the some... It was did. not from the vaccine, it was from tummy flu. Uh, which was uh, no, there was yeah, there was the pandemic. There was yeah. a vac there was a vaccine. There was a, uh, but that's a more recent phenomenon. That's the, there was an influenza vaccine which was using an ad adjuvant called squalene, mm, yeah. which did cause a low percentage of, of narcolepsy, and and the vaccine was immediately withdrawn. But um, but the other thing about the 1918-19 one, which killed so many people, is that many people. Though, though it's difficult to treat viruses, we do have antiviral drugs, but the problem is for flu, but the problem is you, you have to give them very, very early. 
uh, or they don't work very well. So usually by the time people realise they've got a bad flu, it's too late to give the drugs unless it's a contact person mm. and then you can do it or you can protect people from getting it by giving the drug. So the antivirals don't, uh, don't really solve the problem. But a lot of people in 1918, 19 actually died from secondary yeah. bacterial yeah. infection. So that we can handle much better now because, Pneumonia. of course, we have to, even though with antibiotic resistance. And that's something to bear in mind that, you know, everyone says when, when you've got a virus and you go to your doctor, your doctor shouldn't give you antibiotics. Well, that, that's very true. But if you get influenza and it hangs on, and especially if you're older, or if you get a second, you, you're sick and then you seem to get better and then you suddenly get quite sick again. Mm. That's quite possibly a secondary bacterial infection and then you need to go back to your doctor and probably get antibiotics. So it's, it's, we, we try to sell that message, don't give antibiotics when you don't need it, but sometimes people miss it and uh, you, 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 uh, there can be a stage when you do need them. Yeah. So you said that... Uh in uh, today we would have you know know, know what virus it is in a, a in a short the the short world time. Health, health organization there's an influenza network uh, of all the viruses on the planet the one that's most closely watched is actually influenza because it can give these sudden uh, sudden outbreaks and and there are a number of world health organization influenza centers i think it's six mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, cdc in atlanta there's one in tokyo one in Beijing, I think, one in, one in Australia, uh, London. Uppsala. Uppsala, yeah. So there may be, oh, there may be more than that because th th there are the centres and then there are other national labs and so forth that answer, answer to them. But what happens there is that influenza isolates are sent to them uh, reported and then with modern technology they're sequenced almost immediately so we know if it's a new strain or if it's a new variant very very quickly that information is all shared and these in, these um, uh, uh, center directors or center scientists all get together every year I think uh, and decide on the makeup of the flu vaccine for North America for the northern hemisphere and for the southern hemisphere it can be somewhat different and uh, uh, and that's they pass that information on to the vaccine manufacturers, and they're all, of course, private industry, and they make the vaccines. But the problem is that flu viruses change very quickly due to mutation, uh, just like the human immunodeficiency virus. It's a, uh, to be technical, it's a negative strand RNA virus with no proofreading mechanism. That makes it a very simple for you, and and uh, and and they'll mutate very quickly. So so what can happen is. It takes time to produce the vaccine. By the time the vaccine's out there, the, the flu strain may have changed. So sometimes we get a mismatch and you get a very severe flu uh, season from seasonal flu that the vaccine's really not covering. So um, while talking about the, the vaccines, yeah. or if, if there was a pand uh, flu pandemic and there will probably be a vaccine that has to be made. And so that's a topic in your mm -hmm. book. And uh, can you elaborate a bit about that? Because yeah, it's uh, the topic in my book is that it's a novel uh, influenza strain. Yeah. H7N3. Oh, an H7N3. Oh, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> 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 you, you've already got me terrified. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh. and, uh, and actually, the, there's no uh, vaccine. You know, and that's a, that's a problem, as, as Peter uh, uh, puts it. And it kills so young people. And it kills young people, and uh, and we have to wait for this vaccine. So, But that's one thing, that we have to wait for it. It can take weeks before we get it, actually. Months. Months, even months. Yeah, yeah but I wouldn't scare them too much. No. <laughs> months. And the problem is that there will be a shortage. When, it, when we have it, there will be a shortage. Yep. S a huge shortage. Yeah. Especially if it's a if it's a big pandemic, it would be a huge sh uh, shortage. And so the the dilemma in my novel is who is going to have this vaccine. And now you are especially so you might tell me that would never be realistic. But in my uh, novel, because what I'm really interested in is these ethical, mo yeah. moral, political questions. Uh, so in my uh, novel, I I made I made it up. I talked to virologists, but I made it up that it's it's um, 
it shows that the influenza is is uh, much more severe and the mortality is much higher for the African population mm -hmm. because of the tissue. That's another kind of tissue, so the influenza virus will infect them more than us. You might say that would never be here, but anyway, it's fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. So, so the thing is, there you have the African population. Not only the African population in Africa, but also the American Africans and Caribbean Africans and Africans in Sweden and in Denmark and wherever in France. Yeah, uh, and Africans in um, uh, people from Africa in refugee uh, in refugee camps. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Good, good. I forgot that. Exactly. <laughs> and so, actually, they they are the one in the most need of the first portions of vaccine. So my the question I am <laughs> unfolding in this novel is, would we give it to them? Would the international community agree on, okay, they have the, the biggest risk. Are we willing to say, okay, you will have the first uh, portions and we will wait and take the next? So that is, uh, that is what my um, uh, protagonist, my character, my heroine, she's fighting for that. Yeah. And nobody wants to listen to that because it's a little study. She makes a little study in Denmark because that's the first place where, where, where they can see, they, they get this idea that there's something. But the black population in Denmark is so small. So WHO doesn't want to finance that study because if that's true, then you have, uh, then you're in trouble politically. Yeah. yeah, and economically. Well, it's absolutely true. We we we've never made enough vaccine mm. to cover the planet, and part of the problem has been that um, influenza vaccines. It's it's been rather hard. A lot of viral va antiviral vaccines. You you can make a vaccine using technologies we now have to produce enormous amounts of protein, uh, what we call recombinant DNA technology. You can grow things in fermenters and bacteria and all sorts of things, various other types of systems. None of those systems have worked terribly well with influenza, though we're just starting to get some coming through. So most influenza vac vaccine is made with a technology that's been around for 50 more years in embryonated hens. <laughs> yeah. So you have to have chickens making live <laughs> embryonated eggs and then you inject the eggs and it grows in the egg. Now that's the only vaccine that's made that way so the numbers of facilities to make that vaccine are limited. Not only that, uh, the f it, 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 with a pandemic vaccine you'd target it one, just one virus but the normal seasonal influenza vaccine has either three or four different viruses in it. And so, uh, so the amount of vaccine you make like that's rather small. And so, President George W. Bush, you know the the, the, the best younger of one, them. Yeah. the worst one. So <laughs> Not the worst. But actually, actually, <laughs> oh, the younger one. Yeah. There's a couple of things that George, <laughs> I mean, we don't necessarily think very highly of George W. But there are two things that he did which are actually very good. And one of them is he he uh, supported the professionals in CDC and NIH and so forth who wanted to get. Uh, anti-AIDS drugs to Africans mm. and and Bush used his prestige and power and uh, uh, a uh, program called PEPFAR to get drugs cheaply mm. to African and to get mm. the American drug manufacturers for instance to agree that the drugs could be made cheaply by Indian manufacturers mm. and got to and so he's regarded as quite a hero in parts of Africa for that. The other thing is he did, he was persuaded to put an enormous amount of money into vaccine research in influenza to try and get away from this egg thing and try and get it growing in tissue culture and that's still going on. Uh, I think someone convinced President Bush that even rich people get flu. So. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's been a drive in the US for a universal yeah. flu vaccine and uh, yes. can you tell me a bit more why a universal flu vaccine would well, be? Well the problem with influenza is it changes all the time and that the principal target it's, it's a classical evolution. It, it's an antibody-mediated immunity, and uh, and and the the, the 
it, it just will select mutants very quickly. So if you've got antibody to the current flu vaccine, but, but the, the virus mutates, it, it can infect you. And uh, so we get these variants selected very pretty fast. It's, we understand how that happens. What we don't understand is the whole, why it doesn't happen more often, quite mm -hmm. frankly. I mean, I, I've never understood that. So the idea would be is it could be make it. So as, as a consequence of that, we're remaking flu vaccines every year um, to deal with the changes. This is what we call the seasonal influenza change. And that, that's not only expensive, it's, it's inefficient, and, and uh, that's one of the reasons we have that whole influenza network. But if we could make a vaccine which um, uh, went right across the board, of course, that would be fantastic. And we would already have something stockpiled ready to go in case of mm. an H7N3 yeah. pandemic, <laughs> which we've never had. But it's, it's possible. And uh, um, so, so there's a lot of research going on trying to make uh, get parts of the, the proteins on the surface of the virus is what we're trying to trying to make a vaccine against, to try and get shared components. But it, it's complicated for various reasons. It's hard to get to these sites. They don't cause good antibody responses. Um, and um, also there's been some worries about autoimmunity with them. Uh, there's another strategy of working with cell-mediated immunity, the strategy I work with that suggests we could make a, a partially effective flu vaccine that might be much more cross-reactive. Uh, a vaccine that where you get infected, you, wouldn't, you might get a little bit sick, but you wouldn't get dead sick. And uh, that's obviously an advantage, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's difficult. I mean, we, we have to influence, for instance, the regulatory authorities to look at a vaccine that allowed you to get infected, but it decreased the severity of the disease. So a lot of research going on. Nothing, nothing right around the corner, though, unfortunately. But, but, but as far as I have uh, understand, there's also a problem with funding. And there's uh, I, yeah, no, there's a fair amount of fun, quite a bit of funding in yeah, the US, yeah. I think. And uh, but it's just not easy. I mean, no. you know, there's there's a lot of things that. I think it's, this is the same problem we have with climate science. Uh, a lot of people think somehow it'll be just a wonderful technological fix. Yeah. Well, we're very clever and we do fantastic things scientifically, but some things have been just very, very difficult. We haven't made an AIDS vaccine mm. and, the, and billions of dollars have been, well, certainly hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent trying to make an AIDS vaccine and we haven't made one. And a lot of money has actually been spent, especially in the US, trying to make universal flu vaccines, trying to make uh, uh, better technologies for producing a lot of vaccine fast. But it just really hasn't uh, given. Yeah, because if we would have a... Um uh, bird flu probably would be an egg shortage. <laughs> Maybe it could be an egg shortage, and then well, that's also a problem if it's killing the birds. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but we d we don't catch flu from birds. I mean, no. you know, someone may catch a flu from birds, but it's very much more likely that a pig will catch a, yeah, yeah. a flu from birds. In my story is it's, uh, it's a bird and a pig. Yeah, and, and that's it. Oh, the lady. It's a blending. Well, of yeah, it's a bird. It's a that's the classic story. Mm. The 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 flu virus has its genetic material in eight different bits. So if you take two different, completely different flu viruses and you infect, for, by chance, one cell gets infected with two different flu viruses, they can just repackage. And this is where the pandemic strains come from, yeah, yeah. repackaging. Yeah. So the, the swine flu mm. was actually two pig viruses mm. that were in pigs. They weren't infecting humans, but somehow or other an American pig flu virus got together with an Asian pig flu virus. I think th there was an Asian pig on package holiday to Mexico. <laughs> they? And they cohabited <laughs> in a pig hotel or something. <laughs> in fact, our hotel elevator has something about hogs in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the word is. But I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but it, it, and so somehow or other these two pig viruses got mixed up, produced a virus which is incredibly infectious for humans. One of the most infectious flu viruses we've seen, in fact. But fortunately, mm. it wasn't terribly but severe. But that was pure luck. It could have been. It could have been. Yeah. It could have been very severe. Mm. Uh, we didn't understand until the 1960s, really, that flu viruses are actually maintained in nature in aquatic birds. I, we were looking out the window of the Grand Hotel 
and, and you can see uh, there are some uh, uh, swans and geese yeah. uh, on the water. You could take almost any one of those birds and very likely isolate a bird flu virus from it. Mm -hmm. They're gastrointestinal tract infections in birds and uh, the virus survives very well in water. So it, it's, um, it's a perfect mixing system, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, we know, so the experts are quite clear because we know that we will see another pandemic, but we don't know how severe it will be and we don't know when. Mm. So, but are <laughs> while researching your book and writing your book, are you calmed or are you <laughs> a bit more stressed <laughs> <laughs> now? I choose not to think about it <laughs> too much. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so calm, I would say, because this universal vaccine hasn't been produced yet. Mm. And we know, and there's also some uh, um, research in DNA vaccine, which also might be uh, a, a candidate. They never worked all that they well. Never worked, but they've been around a long nevertheless, time. Nevertheless. Yeah. But um, no, I have not been calm because, as I started out to say, uh, it's very much about uh, political leaderships. And um, actually, I talked to the Danish Minister of Health. Yeah. And he's just been appointed uh, a month ago, two months ago. No, three actually, but never mind. And he told me that he had gotten this, my novel. Some Somebody had given yeah. it to him and said, you have to read that. And he was reading it and like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you ha actually you have to read it because you have to be prepared. And I'm not sure that our Western societies are so prepared as they, as they should be because it's like, oh yeah, it might happen, but it's, it's a little science fiction. Mm. It will not happen. And, you know, because it's not only about uh, the medical uh, aspect, it's a, it's a lot, there's a many aspects of it, the, 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 um, uh, the social uh, responsibility, uh, the, the inequality, uh, all these things are also very important, but it's also important how do you organize the society if you have a pandemic? Because what people will do is that they, they will panic, <laughs> as we know, and uh, both in an, in an uh, individual level and in a, in a, in a national level and an international level, people will tend to save themselves first. So the solidarity with the group, uh, your, your neighbors, your family and everybody, uh, your friends, your colleagues, it will very soon be threatened because you want to save your own kids, for instance. And, and you are going to hamster uh, f food and water and all that. And on the pot political level, it will be the same if we are not prepared and if we don't have and that's one of the things I have been saying in, in debates in Denmark. You need to have a moral uh, preparedness too. Because you have to think through what do we do when these instincts, they, they start to, uh, you know, to fuel up and they just the impulses to save ourselves. So um, I don't think we are there. And, uh, and as I said, because for for the citizens to behave uh, right, uh, do the right thing, uh, the, uh, to behave morally and ethically right, you have leaders. You need to have leaders who do the same. If the leaders don't do that, how, how could the citizen then do it? And leaders who you trust also. Yeah. Exactly, leaders that you trust, leaders who have uh, authority, leaders who really are clever and, and, and uh, make uh, wise uh, decisions in a, in a situation of crisis. I think uh, that's, uh, someone who works with public health once told me that you can never do right when working with public health. Either you do too much and then you don't see the, the flu, the pandemic, maybe because yeah. Or, or if you do too little. So flu, flu is particularly difficult. I mean, we, ha we had an enormous scare uh, in the 2000, early 2000s, the bird flu scare. This is, this is a virus that emerged suddenly in, in Hong Kong. It was an infection of birds, and it was killing birds, and suddenly some people started to die from it. And this, this has happened a few times with very virulent... <laughs> 
flu viruses in birds that are highly lethal, uh, transmitting across to humans, killing people, but not transmitting between humans. And so th there was a tremendous, uh, because enormous numbers of birds were dying, and uh, there were a number of cases where this would transmit to humans, they would die horribly, and uh, um, we were sure, or, or the virologists were sure, I'm, I'm not a virologist, they were sure that a, maybe a mutation or two could mean that it would suddenly start to spread between humans. So uh, and everyone became really quite terrified of this whole thing. And enormous num amounts of antiviral drug were bought, Tamiflu. And, and uh, in the United States, for instance, uh, every municipality, uh, school, Every, every organisational structure you had uh, were writing preparedness plans. You had, you had an, uh, uh, office, uh, someone appointed within the institution or the, or the mis municipality, whatever it was, uh, to, to oversee this preparedness uh, and to response plan if you actually, we got this pandemic. Now, of course, it didn't happen. So, so firstly, it created great disillusion mm. because a tremendous effort had been made mm. and that's part of the issue. And, and everyone had been sort of scared and then they think, well, you know, they're just <laughs> trying to wind <laughs> us up. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then the other thing that happened, of course, th is if you went into any of those townships or whatever and said, where's your influenza preparedness plan? They wouldn't know what you're talking yeah, about because exactly. whoever it was was responsible for it has either forgotten or retired or moved on or something. So, so uh, I think this is part of the, part of the human condition really. Uh, we, we, we're very good at reacting mm. to a major uh, threat and we can pull together. And uh, this is happening in Samoa at the moment, mm. actually. Yeah, yeah, with Samoa is having a terrible, terrible measles outbreak. And the reason it's having a terrible measles outbreak is a couple of nurses some time back made a mistake and they mixed, and when they were diluting the measles vaccine, they diluted it by mistake with anaesthetic. <gasps> and they killed two babies. Yeah. And so there was a tremendous reaction against measles vaccination and, and people didn't get their kids vaccinated. And now suddenly they've had this enormous measles outbreak. I mean, I mean there's something like, it's, I think it's 60 or 70 children have died yeah. on Samoa. Uh, I mean, one family, three out of five children died of measles. I mean, completely presentable disease. And, and when, when these two little babies died, the anti-vaccination people came in mm. and stirred everyone up yeah, and yeah. said, don't vaccinate your children, it's dangerous. <laughs> and, and, uh, and one of them's just been arrested, actually. And, yeah. uh, and now they've got 98% coverage of vaccination because people realise, you know, they can protect their children. Uh, American Samoa, which is next door, is just... Um, it so far hasn't had it, they, they've, uh, they've got a universal vaccination program. People will react uh, rationally and, and authorities can react quite rationally but, and, and, and responsibly. And there's generally no, it's not like climate change, it's not a terribly difficult issue for politicians, mm -hmm. uh, vaccination. And, uh, uh, but, but the problem is, the unpredictability of some of these things, particularly with influenza. Yeah. And then it's also what you were talking about before, the prioritization with the vaccine. Prioritization is a real issue. Who is going to have it yeah. in a society? I mean, in Australia, the people who should clearly get the vaccine first would be the Australian Aboriginals. Yeah. They're at greatest risk. Yeah. But you can't really be quite sure who's at risk. The, nine, the 2009 influenza pandemic, normally influenza kills, kills the elderly. Yeah. And... Uh, and, and uh, basically, uh, we the vaccines vaccines are okay, but they're not they're not the greatest vaccines, flu vaccines, and and none of us ever claim that they are. It's better to get vaccinated than not vaccinated, but you can still get infected uh, when you're vaccinated. With the elderly, they've made sort of uh, high dose vaccines yeah. that seem to be working better. But the 2009 one didn't hit the elderly, possibly because they had cross reactive immunity from a much earlier. Mm earlier episode with a related mm. kind of virus. But it did put a lot of very fit young adults into hospital mm. and some of them and some of them were only kept alive by ECMO, you know, the, yeah, the, the um, heart lung machine type technology. Uh, and about that kept about fifty percent 
of people alive who would otherwise have died. But, ev but, it, but those people who were kept alive, some of them have been severely compromised. That's the other thing with old people. When they get flu, it's a, it can be, even if they survive it, it can be a bit like breaking a leg. Yeah. It sort of puts them into permanent yeah. decline and yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, will yeah. die later. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's problematic. And the other, the other group that was particularly severely affected with the 2009 uh, pandemic were, were heavily pregnant women mm. yeah. and, and people who are, are grossly overweight also. So uh, when we, most of us probably are more scared of Ebola or HIV than the flu, so are we scared of the right things or uh, should we be more scared? Uh, uh, Ebola, I mean Ebola is absolutely horrific disease. <laughs> There's currently an Ebola outbreak in the Congo. Uh, I think about the latest figures I saw are about 3,500 people infected. Two-thirds of those have died. It's a horrendous disease. But we know how to handle it. With, and there is a vaccine now, and they, they're starting to use it. But with Ebola, what you need to stop transmission is simply what's called barrier nursing. Yeah. You, just, you just keep people isolated. Uh, everyone around them wears gloves and masks and gowns and uh, it won't, won't transmit. The classically, Ebola is transmitted in African villages. It's what's called wet Ebola. And in some African cultures, there's a tradition of laying hands on and touching the dead. And if they've got wet Ebola, that can infect the person who touches. So, so it's partly cultural. You have to uh, persuade people not to, uh, not to follow that normal cultural practice because it's extremely dangerous. Ebola is not, as things stand, it is not a threat to a society like this because it will be immediately picked up. You've got an advanced medical system mm -hmm. that will handle it straight away. And so uh, even though it is, it is the most appalling infection, and if we got a, somehow we got a variant of this that did spread very readily between humans by respiratory means or something, it would be terrible. But then viruses don't normally change that way so much. So, so even though it's horrific, it, it's not likely to be a pandemic, unless you're writing a good novel about <laughs> it. But, <laughs> but, but the, the one yeah. of the reasons why we should fear a pandemic uh, flu and why, why it's so horrific for us is it's so random. Yeah. yeah, you can't know who's who's uh, getting transmitted and who's not, and that's why you get so scared. Uh, is it your child? Is it my child? You would never know. <coughs> so I think, of course, you have to um, be aware and be prepared. Uh, now it's uh, what they in your field call uh, peacetime, yeah. because uh, the science t in in the field they talk about peacetime and wartime, and now it's peacetime. Be because we don't have an influenza outbreak, a pandemic outbreak. Uh, so it's in peacetime, you have to be ready to, what would you do when war is breaking out? So we have to plan. So we have to plan. But I think what I'm really afraid of, and that's actually what the novel is about, it's, uh, it's a transmission of corruption, uh, of uh, low morale, fake news, uh, inequality, cynicism, uh, crimin uh, criminality. Because one thing I also um, realized when I did the research is that there's one thing we haven't talked about because we are very polite people. We haven't been talking about uh, Big Pharma. And they are not all as nice and clean angels as we would hope they would be. They are not, but you can read the novel to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to look for that. Uh, so I, I don't trust Big Pharma. Um, there are some good ones in Scandinavia, of course, but there are also some very bad ones out there. Um, I don't trust the politicians. Uh, many of the authorities I have doubts about. And then there is, which is also trans transmitting, in my novel, there's also the mafia, the Italian mafia. <laughs> and it's not because I want to <laughs> write a very colorful, action-packed book. It's because I realize that, that there are so many economical interests in this whole field. And also by the mafia. Mm -hmm. They are making uh, false vaccine. They are making, uh, they are stealing yeah. uh, vaccine. They are doing a lot of stuff because there's so much profit in this whole uh, field of uh, uh, medical 
uh, industry and medical. Um, I, I know there has been talks in some countries that, you know, they should, uh, a country should start their own vaccine, uh, pandemic vaccine uh, uh, f uh, manufacturing. So I know there are, because not Would everybody want, uh, uh, want to be, you know, de uh, dependent on yeah. uh, Big Pharma. Yeah. But, but when I was reading your book, Sir Peter, uh, all I felt was, I think we will be fine. <laughs> so um, uh, did I... <laughs> I, d I mean, the, 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 the unknowable is, is uh, you know, there is, it is possible. Uh, there are infections that come across all the time. I mean, who'd heard of Zika virus, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, five years ago? And suddenly it's infecting... Pe it's, it was in the Pacific for years. It's a mosquito-borne yeah. infection. It was in the Pacific for years. Um, Nobody was terribly worried about it. Uh, it was causing infections. People got fevers. They got better. Then suddenly it gets into South America where it's never been before. And we get what's called a virgin soil outbreak because there's no immunity whatsoever. But uh, suddenly a lot of women, are uh, a fair number of children are being born with, f with congenital de deformities. And uh, we'd never seen this before with this type of virus. So that suddenly became a, a major concern. Then you get into all sorts of moral and ethical issues about, say, termination of pregnancy in a Catholic country, for instance. Mm. Um, no vaccine has been made. Often with, with things like Zika virus, uh, and it's all calmed down because a lot of people got infected. They didn't get severe consequences because with many of these infections, People, a lot of people get infected, but it's only a small proportion that get a severe consequence, in this case, pregnant women. And uh, so we, even though it's probably perfectly possible to make a vaccine, I don't think there's a vaccine out there. No, no but there's but a candidate. But maybe it's a little out of, uh, out of what we should talk about, but on the other hand, I think it's very interesting and important. And that is these new uh, zoonoses we are going to see because of the climate change. So we are going to have new viruses and new uh, illnesses in our hemisphere, which we didn't have bec before because of the climate changes. So sometimes it's, f it's l l what you were talking about, Zika. They have Zika now, I think, in southern France. Yes, they had three yes. cases well exactly. already infected. So it's very, I mean, how do these viruses get around? And Deng Deng dengue fever. Dengue fever in, in the 1940s was pretty much in Southeast Asia. Mm. Now it's in the Caribbean, it's all around the place. These are all mosquito-borne, so obviously Greece and you're not going to see them where you don't have mosquitoes. That's, uh, that, that's obvious. So we are going to see uh, many yeah. of these uh, yeah. diseases which we didn't have to care about before. Well, we didn't know about them. And, and if you look, for instance, um, fruit bats. Mm. Uh, if anyone in the 1990s had said, well... Do bats transmit infection? You said yes. Uh, vampire bats in South America transmit rabies, and they'll, they'll bite cattle, and they'll give cattle rabies. And occasionally, a uh, person gets infected with um, with one of these types of they're called lysoviruses, a rabies-like virus. It's not actually rabies, but something very like it. And occasionally, someone will get it, get infected and die. So we knew about that. But then suddenly along comes SARS mm, yeah. in Africa. That's a bat virus. Mm. And we'd never seen this before. And there's actually a movie about that yes. called Contagion. Have you seen Contagion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People seen Contagion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, a v it's probably the best movie that's ever been made about a pandemic. Mm. Uh, but it was too realistic, so it didn't do well <laughs> at the box office. Uh, but it, it goes into a lot of the problems yeah, yeah, exactly. that you've been talking yeah. about. And, so, and it's, it's, uh, y you get to see Gwyneth Paltrow with the top of her head taken off. It's not really Gwyneth. It's a <laughs> Gwyneth dummy. But, you know, so. but um, she's now selling nutraceuticals or whatever it is. You know, useless crap. Done. Um, so... Uh, um, so th but now we know there's a whole lot of these viruses in bats. Hendra virus, Nipah virus, both isolated in Southeast Asia. Uh, SARS virus. SARS virus is a virus which went into a little animal called a Himalayan civet cat and then that infected people because they were in sort of live animal markets in China. Uh, the Nipah virus goes into pigs and then goes from pigs to people. Hendra virus, which goes to horses and then horses to people and so forth. So we now know we've got all these viruses in bats we knew nothing about. And but it's also because uh, the humans are invading 
the habitats sure. of the animals. Well, not only that, it's part of the problem. So with the horses, mm. it's people keeping horses who, who, if you keep a horse in the same yeah. um, same paddock as a fruit tree, yeah. Yeah. the bat feeds on the fruit, contaminates the fruit with the infection, doesn't completely consume the fruit, that falls to the ground, then it gets eaten by the horse. The horse then gets infected and the horse can then infect a person. And so, so there's this kind of transmission cycle that, that goes on. So, But I think what, what I'm trying to say is that there is, it's not so, something which suddenly comes out of the blue. It is always in connection with our behavior, yeah. what is going to happen. Yeah. So it's not like that. Yeah, we so don't have any, uh, any part of, of these escalating uh, viruses and risk of pandemics. So I would love to speak more, but uh, before we finish, uh, I'm going to ask you to give a short advice. <laughs> so how would you, what, what would you, if you, how would you handle it, or what would you tell people to, you know, learn from this speech, uh, from this talk? <laughs> <laughs> you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think the, in a pandemic situation, the important thing is to take a notice of what the responsible authorities are saying. And, and w one of the things may be to recommend more, more social isolation, for instance. Mm -hmm. one, of the w you know, one of the things we could do now that you couldn't do in, say, 1918, is people could isolate themselves much more effectively because uh, we could have food delivered, uh, we could protect the deliverers with, with drug or with vaccine. Uh, you could decide selectively to use vaccine to protect the people who delivered food and to uh, essential services, which is one of the first calls on any vaccine in an emergency. Uh, and you could communicate uh, via internet and people could work from home. So there are various things. I, I think it's always important to listen to the people who are actually responsible and, and, and understand the situation best. Uh, in general, with all infections, I mean, you know, get the standard vaccines. I get vaccinated whenever possible. I like getting <laughs> <vaccinated>. <laughs> So do I. <laughs> so I'm vaccinated. Uh, maybe, the flu. maybe masochism or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think it's, of course, it's, imp it's important to survive. And if you have kids or grandchildren, yeah. or whatever you want them to survive, it, that's priority number one. But I also think it's very important to survive morally. So I think you also have to think about how how can I get through that? And the reason my uh, novel is called uh, Like the Plague is actually because of the plague uh, Camus, Albert Camus. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, because his uh, novel is about how to act morally uh, yeah. right in a pandemic situation. And I think that is very inspiring because what why... Uh, What's what's the point of surviving if you have uh, compromised the best in yourself or the best in ourselves as mankind? So that gives us something to <laughs> think about. So thank you so much for coming here and speaking with me and uh, thank you all of you for coming here and listening to us. So uh, big round of applause, I would say. <laughs> <laughs>